and welcome to day two of the e-congress for ULAR 2020 um, and welcome to today's episode of ULAR News. My name is Mrinalini Day and I'm an academic clinical fellow and junior doctor in rheumatology in Liverpool in the UK. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Um, I'd like to introduce to you first of all my three fellow reporters. Over to you Eduardo. Hi, I'm Eduardo Prediletto and I'm a Versus Arthritis PhD student. I work at the William Harvey Research Institute in the UK in London and I'm part of the Argos group of Professor Bombardieri, where we investigate autoimmune diseases. And I introduce you to my colleague, Sebastian. Hi, I'm Sebastian Rodriguez Garcia. I'm a consultant rheumatologist working in, the, in La Princesa University Hospital in Madrid. And my research focuses mostly on prediction of outcomes in RA using machine learning techniques. And now I'm gonna introduce you to Fabian. Thank you, Sebastian. Hello again, this is Fabian Proft and I'm from the Charité Universal Hospital in Berlin. And I will present you today the insights on anxious mandula arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. And now back to you, Minnie. Thank you, Fabian. And um, so we've got a very packed program for you today, covering a wide variety of areas, including the patient sessions, lots of um, items on rheumatoid arthritis, and also some items from the basic translational science sessions. So Fabian is now going to tell us about the sessions he attended on spondyloarthritis today. Thank you. And I would like to report on the new treatment options in um, axial spondyloarthritis. And first of all, I want to share some data which were presented by Desiree van der Heide from the Leiden University in the Netherlands. And she presented the 48 weeks results of the placebo controlled phase 2b dose ranging study of the IL 17a and F inhibitor bimikizumab in patients with radiographic axial spa. And summarized briefly, the primary endpoint was met which is the most important thing for a phase two trial. And bimikizumab showed a rapid and sustained improvement of patient reported outcomes. And interestingly, there were no differences between the 160 milligram and the 320 milligram dosage. And so in um, the upcoming phase three trials or the ongoing phase three trials and the whole spectrum of actual SPA, only the 160 milligram dosage every four weeks for bimikizumab will be investigated and this could be a further treatment option in the future for actual SPA patients. And um, Dennis Podudny from our center at the Charité in Berlin, he presented the 10-year data um, of clinical course of the German spondyloarthritis inception cohort called GESPIC. And this observational cohort is so unique because already in the beginning of this millennium, so 20 years ago, when the cohort started recruitment, patients from the whole spectrum of actual SPA were included. And we have to remember that at these times, not even classification criteria for actual spondyloarthritis have existed. And now we have the long-term data of 10 years of observation for all these patients. And the key messages are, in this long-term observation, patients with non-radiographic actual SPA and radiographic actual SPA showed similar disease courses in terms of the disease activity. And um, Fabian, how about treatment? For the treatment, it is a bit different because we also have to take into account that this um, cohort started 20 years ago recruitment where the ther therapeutic options were different than they are today. And we can see that a lower proportion of patients with non-radiographic actual SPA were treated with TNF inhibitors, but this might also be reflected the later introduction of this mode of action for the indication of non-radiographic patients. Um, and when looking further on uh, non-radiographic actual SPA patients and their treatment options, I want to highlight um, the phase three data that were presented by Jürgen Braun from Herne uh, of the PREVENT study, also a placebo-controlled phase three trial investigating the efficacy of sicokinumab in non-radiographic actual SPA patients. And to make it very shortly, um, sicokinumab 150 milligrams met the primary endpoint which was defined as an ASAS-40 response to week 16 and week 52 for the US and TNF inhibitor naive patients with non-radiographic actual SPA. And due to this data, a relevant gap in available treatment options was closed because the EMA recently approved sicokinumab 150 milligrams for the treatment of active non-radiographic actual SPA. And there is important that these patients need to have objective signs of inflammations as an elevated CRP level or also um, inflammation seen in the, um, uh, in the MRI in patients who did not respond to first-line therapies like NSAIDs and um, physiotherapy. And 
There's also one other abstract that I really liked, uh, which came from the group from Adrian Sierrer from Zurich, Switzerland. And they presented some interesting data from the Swiss Clinically um, Quality Management Program on gender differences and non-radiographic actual spa patients. And their data really stresses again that female patients have a longer diagnostic delay. And, but when looking um, at treatment response, what you were asking just uh, now, Sebastian, was that female patients had a significantly lower response rate to TNF inhibitors. And I think this is something that we have to take into, in, into account in our clinical practice, and which should also be addressed in further research projects. Thank you, Fabian, for that insight from the um, spondyloarthritis treatment posters. Um, now to something a bit different. Um, I actually had the opportunity to attend um, some of the PARE sessions today, um, and this included one session on COVID-19. Now, um, whether you're a patient, doctor, health professional, student or scientist, COVID-19 will have impacted you in some way over the past few months. Um, and when we look at patients who've got rheumatic disease, um, this has had quite a profound effect on the way that they've had to lead their lives, whether this be staying indoors or shielding for those of them in the UK, um, or just having reduced access to um, aspects such as patient groups and support groups. In order to investigate this further, Professor Rini Geenan and Tim Coppert from the Leiden University explored one aspect of this, the psychological impact of COVID-19 on patients with inflammatory arthritis. They did an online survey um, looking at aspects um, relating to coronavirus at the peak of infection in the Netherlands, and they recruited 177 individuals. They looked at factors such as mental well-being and stress and found that those with inflammatory arthritis were more likely to be worried about infections than healthy people and were more stressed than usual, although this was the case also in the healthy cohort. The mental well-being of patients with inflammatory arthritis was not found to be lower than a similar survey conducted two years ago. Mariela Nini, these are really relevant results. What are the clinical implications out of it? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so the authors did not wish to speculate too much on the results, particularly given the COVID-19 situation is continually unfolding. However, they did provide some useful tips for our patient viewers um, and indeed anyone who was watching who may be worried about the COVID-19 situation, such as um, wearing gloves when shopping, seeking the social support of friends and family and not keeping worries to ourselves and encouraging people to talk. Um, and the views of patients is very important when trying to understand um, research questions and prioritizing research, um, not just in the current situation, but throughout the whole of rheumatology research. And this is where patient and public involvement comes in. And I um, was very pleased to read an abstract, um, a poster actually, in the PARE session by Savia de Souza from London, who actually was looking at the implications of PPI, patient public involvement, in clinical trials. And this was explored in the RT Cure Consortium, which focuses on earlier interventions and treatment for the prevention and the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the study revealed that there's many challenges for the involvement of patients and public members in this arena, some of which um, were included um, enabling participation and enabling understanding between all parties. And it just highlights the need for continued um, increase of patient and public involvement in this arena and um, more of a focus, um, particularly in the arena of clinical trials. To find out more about this important work, you can head over to the PARE poster session um, and find poster 0007 to find out more. And other aspects of patient experience of inflammatory arthritis, such as fatigue and pain, are very important for our understanding of these diseases. And Sebastian is going to tell us more about this in the context of rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you, Mrinalini. Uh, so today I've got the chance to attend the RA Prognosis, Predictors and Outcomes session, and also take a look at the poster session on non-biologic treatments and small molecules. First, I would, I would like to highlight a Belgian study in which 350 patients from the CARE RA trial were split uh, between those achieving DAS28 CRP remission at WIT16 and those who did not. And after that, 
they longitudinally compare fatigue in both groups uh, using the multidimensional fatigue inventory. All fatigue domains analyzed were significantly lower on the first group as compared with, to their counterparts. Um, during the whole longitudinal follow-up, it was two, as a two-year longitudinal follow-up. So the others uh, and, and, and the, uh, the communication underlying the importance of early disease control, not only in radiographic progression or other clinical outcomes, but also in patient preferred outcomes such as fatigue. Um, there's, there's another very interesting abstract by Dr. Shett's group regarding pain, where they analyzed whether the volume of a specific signal in the brain called ball that is measured by functional MRI at base at baseline could predict the pain response to TNF inhibitors. Patients uh, underwent a functional MRI at baseline and they um, applied a painful sti stimulus uh, like putting pressure on the metacarpophalangeal joints. So when they were applying this stimulus, patients were underwent a functional MRI. So they stratified the, the whole group in those between, uh, between those with low and high signals. Then they randomized those patients to either sertilizumab or placebo and performed two more MRIs at weeks 12 and weeks 24. Interestingly, they found that those patients on the sertilizumab group with a high baseline signal uh, based on this, on, this, on this ball signal showed a better response at the end of the study uh, regarding this arthritis-related brain activity. So somehow using this functional MRI uh, volume measuring of this signal can, can say us who, which patients will, will, will get better, will do better regarding pain related in, uh, when treated with TNF inhibitors. Um, the, third, the third abstract I would like to highlight is the one from the ESPOA cohort. Um, they, and they analyzed the 10 year, uh, they, they, they did a 10 year safety analysis of, of patients with early arthritis that were using very low dose of steroids. This very low dose was a median of two milligrams per day. So it, it, was, it was quite a, a, a low dose. They explore in around 400 patients of, of the cohort um, a composite uh, outcome, including death, cardiovascular disease, severe infection, and fracture. Um, they use a, um, a weighted COX-10 dependent analysis with appropriate propensity score uh, methods applied to tackle confounding and also channeling bias, and concluded that these patients on very low doses of steroids not only had a long-term high risk of these severe outcomes, but also that this risk uh, increased over time in a increase in a dose and time dependent manner. So that was a very insightful, um, uh, very insightful study about the use of low dose of steroids, and it definitely adds to the literature that almost any dose of steroids in, uh, comes without some harms. Thanks, Sebastian. You've told us quite a bit about um, drugs such as sertilizumab and steroids now, um, but what about the small molecules? Well, regarding the small molecules, um, I would like to comment a little bit on the 84-week results of the SELECT monotherapy trial. In this study, br briefly in this study, patients were randomized to either continue uh, with methotrexate as a blinded drug or switch to OPA15 or OPA30 milligrams a day until the week 14. From this point, patients entered a blinded, entered a blinded long-term extension and patients on the methotrexate arm were, were um, pre-specified to, uh, to, to go under uh, uh, either of these two arms. Um, after week 14 and until week 84, there were only two arms, OPA15 and OPA30, and around 500 patients were followed up until the, the week 84. At this time point, the AZR 20, 50, and 70 responses were 65, 50, 40, and for uh, UPA 15, and 75, 60, 50 for UPA 30. The most frequent adverse event was urinary tract infections, and 
after this analysis, the, the, the authors conclude that there were no new safety signals uh, and both OPA arms resulted in continued and sustained improvements until the, uh, the week 84. Sebastian, sorry to interrupt, but could you maybe go a little bit more into detail on the safety aspects? Uh, were there any new information about thromboembolic events for in, uh, of interest or any other safety concerns raised? Yeah, um, well, um, re regarding uh, infections, the, um, I can say that the most frequent serious infection was pneumonia. And uh, there were other events uh, regarding uh, herpes zoster and liver, liver disorders and CK elevations that were higher in the, in the OPA 30 arm. And regarding the, the thromboembolic events and major ad adverse uh, cardiovascular events, there were five patients that experienced each of, the, each of those. And, uh, but in all cases, there were, all these patients had underlying conditions so this is why uh, it was expected and, and, and it was consistent with previous data. So that, that's why um, the others conclude that there were, there were no new safety signals uh, in this long-term long extension of, the, of, of this trial. And those are the communications I would like to highlight for today's Eula TV news. And now I think Eduardo will comment some basic aspects of Array. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I kept my promise to hand down the most relevant translational science session, and today I decided to focus on cell immunotherapy. So I followed the dendritic cells as therapeutic session, which, as you can imagine, focused on understanding the potential of dendritic cells as tool for therapy, but also on recognizing the potential to target dendritic cells in vivo and to explore the relevance of dendritic cell migration. So an interesting presentation has been given from uh, Yulia Kurochkina of the Research Institute uh, of Clinical and Experimental Lymphology of Novosibir. And the study she carried with her colleagues and presented today aimed to investigate the mechanism of dexamethasone modified disease or dex disease, and specifically their inhibitory effect on autologous T cells from the same array patient. So, in a nutshell, they recruited 20 patients with array from which then the disease have been generated. And what they evaluated in the study is first the ability of DEX disease to induce T cell apoptosis and then to inhibit the production of Th1, Th17 cytokines in an auto-mixed co culture. So, the data obtained indicated that DEX disease from array patients have an immunosuppressive effect on autologous T cells to the induction of apoptosis and energy. Um, Eduardo, um, I, I, was, I was wondering if they, uh, they check other subsets of, of, of T cells? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, apparently these cells are able to activate T regulatory T cells and these, in their opinion, authorize their application as a DC vaccine. So um, my comment is that this is an in vitro study and despite the results looking encouraging, I would be curious to see uh, the impact of this modified disease uh, in vivo and specifically regarding any possible side effects on immunosuppression, such as viral reactivation or bacterial response. Uh, well, then uh, the other presentation I wanted to comment about has been elegantly given by Dr. Catherine Ilkens, reader in immunotherapy at the University of Newcastle, and was a sum up of where we stand in this field. So she highlighted the achievement in this topic, like the manufacture of clinical grade therapeutic disease, their safety and the low toxicity reached so far. And she also added that while we are quite ahead regarding investigation in cancer, indeed we achieved an increase uh, antigen specific T cells responses and, a, and enhances infiltration of CD8 T cells in tumor tissue with modest clinical effects. We are still lacking robust evidence in autoimmune disease. Um, so, Eduardo, based on that, do you think we are close to a uh, standardized monotherapy? Well, um, the safety and feasibility of dendritic uh, cell of uh, DC-based immunotherapies in the treatment of solid and hematologic uh, tumors are well documented. However, we can say that av available clinical data indicate that DC-based vaccination as a monotherapy provide us suboptimal and still unsatisfactory clinical benefits. Uh, I can think about, there is the Cipulicel T, 
uh, which is the first disease-based cancer vaccine or uh, used for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, which is actually approved by the FDA. So I would say that while this is a very interesting topic, there are still a lot of challenges to overcome for other diseases, like the production of an optimal DC therapy or the roots and dose of administration. Also, we have to really be sure that the disease we are injecting uh, will migrate where we want. So a lot of things like this, but if the de development of CAR T cells has taught us something, uh, I think the future looks promising for DC therapy. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I think it's been really fantastic that we've managed to go right from bench to bedside, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis today, going from the translational science right through to the predictors, the outcomes, and patient experience of disease. Don't forget, we'd love to see where you are watching ULAR News from and the Congress from this year. So don't forget to send in your photos via the ULAR social media channels using the hashtag ULAR News. Similarly, if you'd like to contact us or post any comments or queries about today's show and any of the items you see on ULAR TV, again, contact us via the ULAR social media channels um, and using the hashtag ULAR News. We'll see you again tomorrow when we will be covering a vast variety of topics again, including more translational science in the rheumatic diseases and outcomes and predictors of rheumatoid arthritis. We'll also be covering osteoporosis as well and some more items on spondyloarthritis. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.